so Dr. Bill Jordan is co-director of medical student education and director of the preventive medicine residency in the Department of Family and Social Medicine at Montefiore Einstein in the Bronx. He currently serves as president of the National Physicians Alliance and previously served as co-chair of the Policy and Legislative Committee of the Public Health Association of New York City. And today he'll be speaking on my doctor would never do that. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction, and I really appreciate everybody coming out here today. Um, I am going to be talking a little bit about prescriber um, and physician activities and the data that's available around these actions. These are my disclosures. Um, I don't take any funding. My opinions are my own and not those of my employer. Um, and I am the spouse of an employee of Data and Society, in full disclosure. Um, I wanted just to mention a little bit about National Physicians Alliance. It's a nonprofit, uh, about 10,000 doctors across the country, across specialties. We were really founded 10 years ago to advocate alongside patients and also to uh, fight for the integrity of the profession. So let's talk about a little bit about market forces in medicine. And I definitely don't claim to be an economist, um, but I do know that doctors deliver healthcare services. Through delivering healthcare care services, they generate their own income. They also generate income for others, um, sometimes on purpose, sometimes incidentally, and they generate costs for others. So we're gonna unpack that a little bit over the course of the presentation. So hopefully this will work. I'm gonna switch over to a quick video. So maybe some of you remember that from about five years ago. Um, that was part of a, a political campaign that imploded, um, in and it hinged around her statements about talking about how to reform how doctors are reimbursed. Um, so it's, it is a serious issue, but um, you can see that elected officials often have trouble um, navigating it as well. So let's talk about a brief history of how doctors have been paid. Uh, in the 1930s, it was really you brought what you had to see the doctor, and that's how you paid. Um, doctors really opposed the introduction of insurance as a method of paying for health care initially and in terms of their professional societies. But as probably most of you know, World War II really enshrined insurance, particularly as something that was provided by employers. Um, before 1965, there were a lot of issues in terms of how doctors got reimbursed and in terms of whether they were always acting with, <coughs> excuse me, acting with integrity. There were things like fee splitting, which was basically kickbacks from a primary care provider uh, to a specialist that was uh, referring, uh, receiving the referral. They would give a kickback back to the primary care provider. There were things called ghost surgeries, which was basically the patient was already anesthetized, and the surgery would be subcontracted to somebody else who would get a portion of the, of the funding. Um, there was uh, ra rampant surgical overuse, the appendectomies for people with stomach aches, hysterectomies for women with uh, abdominal pain that were really unnecessary. And a lot of these things, um, you know, brought about public outcry. Um, doctors often complained about their insecurity relative to other professionals like um, plumbers and other people that they, they might compare themselves with, but patients felt really squeezed with almost half of patients feeling like they were um, being charged by doctors more than they could afford. In this context, and especially um, with the poor and the elderly having real problems paying for their health care bills, in 1965 we had the introduction of Medicare and Medicaid. Doctors as an organized profession opposed it, um, but it ended up, in terms of the negotiation, becoming a windfall for them. Doctors ended up charging two to four times as much to Medicare for the same services as they charged to private insurance companies. Uh, in the 1970s, uh, under Nixon, actually, the HMOs really became enshrined, and um, they have a very mixed track record, but it really um, brought about the idea um, more broadly of, of capitation, where instead of paying for an individual service that a doctor provided, you would pay per month um, t uh, for the care of a patient. But it really failed to slow um, the growth in health care costs, which was uh, one of the main uh, aims of introducing it. Um, in, in the 1990s, for many of us who lived through it, there were failed reforms in health care. Um, and 69% of the public, um, uh, which was an all-time high, said that doctors were too driven by money. 
So it remains a public concern throughout our history. Um, in 2010, the Affordable Care Act really has um, driven an acceleration and consolidation of insurers and healthcare organizations. Doctors are increasingly salaried, but there's still a large percentage that receive uh, fee-for-service payments for each individual service they deliver. Um, but the pharmaceutical company remained untouched during this, and doctors still um, remain among the highest earners in society. So, why is this a problem? Um, it, it creates a, a, an obvious conflict of interest. The Institute of Medicine, um, now the National Academy of Medicine, talked about this in 2009 as an undue pursuit of financial gain or secondary interests, and it really is seen to have a, a corrosive influence on clinical care, on our research enterprise in healthcare, and on the education of um, the doctors of the future and healthcare providers of the future. And it really has um, involved an erosion of public trust. Um, one piece of this is that almost all doctors have a relationship with the pharmaceutical industry. Um, the data uh, shows that 83% of doctors uh, self-report having taken food or gifts, um, and 78% report um, having taken samples. And free samples are about 50% uh, of the marketing budget of pharmaceutical companies. Um, doctors, uh, unfortunately, often acknowledge that others around them are influenced, but rarely think that they themselves are influenced um, by the pharmaceutical industry, and, but patients don't agree with that assessment. Um, and as just one example, generalists in primary care receive two sales calls per day on average from pharmaceutical companies. Now, this wouldn't necessarily be a problem in and of itself, but conflict of interest seems to um, help drive avoid uh, avoidable costs. Um, in some estimates, there are about $213 billion of avoidable costs per year in the U.S. healthcare system. Um, and these drive things uh, like non-adherence of patients, because when they get prescribed a, a medication that's more expensive than an equivalent one that might be cheaper, they tend um, to skip it or try to stretch it out and not take it every day. Um, it drives overprescription of antibiotics, um, underutilization of generics, just as uh, several examples. So th that provides a little bit of a frame for talking about what is the public data on um, doctor actions, both in delivering services and in prescribing. And for the purposes of this talk, I'm really gonna focus on the publicly available data that's been made available over the past few years through Medicare. Um, and in particular, the, um, the data around outpatient care. So hospital care is a huge driver of healthcare costs, um, but uh, we'll, we're gonna focus on ambulatory or outpatient settings for today. So just as a review, because uh, CMS will be referred back to over the course of the presentation, this is the Centers of Medicare and Medicaid Services. It's an agency within the Department of Health and Human Services, and legally Medicare is mandated by, by the government to cover items and services that are reasonable and necessary. So there's a lot of flexibility in that. Um, and Traditionally, the covered groups are those who are over 65, um, 65 or over within the country, and those that are um, disabled. So claims data on prescriptions and services were available historically internally, but not released. Uh, and, and there is about a roughly two year lag in processing the data, which is a pretty enormous pile of data to be fair. But, um, so let's talk, we're gonna talk a little bit about the prescriber data, and then we're gonna talk a little bit about um, delivery of services data. And if you'll forgive me, because I know anecdotes can be sometimes misleading, I'm gonna use some illustrative anecdotes. Um, so uh, for those of you that are familiar with Medicare, it has a bunch of different parts. There's part A that covers hospital care, part B that covers outpatient services, and part D uh, that since the early 2000s has covered a, a drug benefit. So it covers about a quarter of all outpatient prescriptions in the country, so a, a huge proportion. Um, and the data that's in the database includes prescribers, and that could be anybody who's able to write a prescription. Um, doctors, nurse practitioners, physician assistant, dentist, um, the whole spectrum. And it's, it is identified by a unique identifier, the national um, provider identifier, which is called the NPI. And one of the shortcomings of this is that it subsumes trainees and supervisees. So if I have residents in my clinic that are still in training, um, I have to count, countersign all of their prescriptions and all of that data will come in under my NPI until the resident gets to the point in their training where they have their own um, personal identifier. 
The data that's in the set includes total number of claims, including initial prescriptions and refills of prescriptions, and it includes the number of beneficiaries, the total re retail cost of all the prescriptions, but it doesn't have any individual patient information. Um, this is an interesting point because uh, a, lot of, a lot of prescriber data um, is actually uh, sold by pharmacies to private companies to churn through, and there's been a lot of controversy about whether that information is really um, de-identified properly. And for the most part, it can be matched back up with patients. Um, so it's it it becomes an issue of um, Medicare is probably actually being more careful with this than um, than private industry is, which is appropriate because it's a public agency. Um, there is data on overall spending and the number of prescriptions, and then it's broken down nationally. It's uh, aggregated nationally and then broken down by state. Uh, in terms of patient privacy, they don't give any information for a specific drug that's been prescribed if there have been less than 11 prescriptions per provider or less than 11 beneficiaries that have received it to try and preserve that firewall. Um, and we can, we can discuss a little bit later. Probably a lot of you know better than I do about whether that's adequate or not. Um, the interesting history of this is that Medicare didn't um, voluntarily release this data. ProPublica, which is a nonprofit journalist, uh, journalism agency, they put forward a FOIA request in, in 2013, um, and that really led to the first release of the information, and then CMS agreed to release it um, going forward year after year. And they set up their own website starting in 2015. Before that, ProPublica was um, putting up the data on their own website for public consumption. So if you look at the data I'm prescribing, it's about 1.3 million providers. Um, and they wrote about 1.4 million prescriptions. Uh, there are only 410,000 providers that are included in the publicly available data um, because those are for um, people that have written more than 50 prescriptions for at least one drug, uh, again, to protect uh, privacy. Um, ProPublica, in addition to the specific data, they've, they've added some features. So if you go to their website versus um, looking at the CS CMS data directly, you'll see that they flagged it for controlled substances, uh, things like opioids, um, and then also risky drugs for the elderly. Uh, an example being, um, again, opioids, um, but also benzodiazepines, things um, that you might know as like Xanax or Valium or things like that that have been shown to have um, adverse effects and increased risk of falls. Um, and other, other uh, highly problematic side effects. So ProPublica has estimated that there's maybe $300 million in waste. Um, now, when you think about uh, healthcare making up about 17% of uh, gross domestic product at this point, um, we can debate how big a piece of the pie that is, um, and maybe we'll talk about that a little bit later. So I'm going to get a little bit into the tools. And you can see here um, the example of how ProPublica has packaged the data, which maybe some of you have played with. Um, this is called prescriber checkup, and this is really looking at prescriptions. So you can see, you can look at state comparisons here. Um, and uh, you can look at the national aggregate and, and the states over here. You can look by particular medication. Uh, and then you can search for a particular prescriber or a city or zip code if you're looking, um, trying to get more of an idea of uh, what the cost is in a community or, or a neighborhood. Um, and it offers comparisons uh, across doctors um, and across specialties. So I'll put forward a model provider, and in disclosure, this is a friend of mine who I've worked with for a while, um, but I was looking for doctors to show, and so I, I had a hunch that she was probably good on these indicators, and it turned out she was. Um, so she's an internal medicine doctor. She works at a um, federally qualified health center on 161st Street in the Bronx, um, and this is the kind of report that you can get if you look on ProPublica that's pulled from this uh, Medicare data. So she's a primary care internist. Um, she's written about, this is all 2013 data because of the two-year lag. Um, she's written about 7,000 prescriptions. Um, total retail price is about $300,000 uh, for the year. Um, but that ranks her at 2,800 out of 5,200 doctors. So she's in the lower half um, of doctors in her specialty. Um, she cares for about 416 do uh, patients, which is probably a little bit on the low side, but she's also um, teaches, so that's part of it. Uh, and then uh, 
but most of her patients are over 65, and most of her patients have subsidized claims for low-income patients. This becomes important because often for low-income patients who have Medicare, they actually have fewer barriers to getting um, expensive drugs and not as many, um, many cost-sharing mechanisms for steering them towards generics. Um, so down here, you can see a little bit of how she's compared to other people in her same specialty. Um, so she only prescribed um, brand name drugs 23% of the time, and the average is 27%. She only um, incurred uh, prices of $41 for her patients uh, on average compared to $71 among her peers. So she's very cost conscious, which makes sense in terms of working in a community health center um, and patients that have difficulty affording their medications. Um, and she actually prescribes a little bit less than the, than the average doctor, 16 um, prescriptions per patient. If you can imagine that patients are getting on average 16 prescriptions when they're over 65 but that's sadly the, the climate that we're in. Um, so the report gives you a little bit more data when you scroll down. Um, and as I mentioned, ProPublica added on some additional things looking at what they um, labeled as Schedule II and Schedule III. So those are controlled substances like opioids that I was mentioning. Um, so look at antipsychotic drugs, um, particularly the newer generation of atypical antipsychotics have been overprescribed um, for what's called off-label uses, things that aren't FDA approved. Um, there are things that they've uh, described as risky for seniors, and that's decided by the uh, American um, Geriatric Society. They have a, a list um, of drugs that they've reviewed that have good evidence that they're risky for people over 65. Um, benzodiazepines I mentioned earlier, um, being in the top 10 prescribers for the drug in the country, which you see she doesn't fall into any of the categories. Um, and if you look at the medications, uh, I'll just, you'll, for those of you that aren't familiar with all these medication names, you'll take my word for it. They're all generic, um, and they're all bread and butter things. They're like for high blood pressure and diabetes, um, and there's, uh, there are two for cholesterol. So kind of typical um, chronic illness for an older population uh, medications. So what's behind expensive prescribing? Because that's, that was the whole idea behind like looking at this data and making it publicly available. Um, here's another doctor that I don't know personally, but um, also labeled in the database as internal medicine. And if you look at her profile, um, she's generating uh, $1.9 million in retail price of, of her prescriptions uh, for only 100 patients, so a quarter of the patients of the uh, previous doctor. And, um, and she is uh, taking care of almost all low-income patients. So you can see prescription price for her patients is $441 on average compared to $71 among her peers. Um, does anybody have any guesses of, of what's going on? What's that? Okay, so overcharging Medicaid. Um, so these are these are all Medicare prescriptions, but it, that's a that's a consideration. Um, Right. Um, so sometimes uh, physicians, even if they're in a general uh, generalist specialty, they care for specific uh, subpopulations uh, that have more expensive medications. Um, and sometimes people are mislabeled in the database. Were you going to say something? Uh, you or somebody in the back? No. Okay. Um, this includes uh, this includes the entire price, including what the patient would pay. But that's a good question. Okay, so I'll um, I'll reveal uh, what's going on, and and I know the the print is small, so again you'll have to trust me. Um, let's see, about uh, I think it's eight of the ten medications here are for HIV. Um, let's see, we've got amlodipine and alendronate, right? and are the only non-HIV, and the rest are HIV drugs. There are a few HIV drugs that are um, generic, but, um, but adherence has been 
clearly shown to be much better when you're able to give combination pills, and those have been developed more recently and are mostly still on patent. Um, so this is something where somebody might be flagged as saying like, oh, what's going on? They're way above average for their specialty, and they're spending all this money. Uh, but if you look at the data and who they're caring for, it totally makes sense. Um, so this is a this is a something problematic in terms of like a first pass look of what the data reveals. Um, but a lot of the value in the in the data is often looking at outliers. So let's look at another outlier. Um, so this is somebody I pulled out just by looking at the database um, and looking at somebody who had a lot of uh, cost. Uh, they actually have a little bit less total retail price of all their prescriptions um, compared to the previous provider. Uh, and uh, again, a lot of low income patients. Um, and their prescription price is around $168 um, for the average price of the prescription compared to $71 for the average patient. So let's look a, at a little bit um, in a little bit more detail. And if you scroll down the page, it'll show you like a whole list of their medications, but I'm just showing you the, the top 10. Um, so again, if you'll trust me, I'll tell you that only atorvastatin and furosemide are, are generic. Uh, and these are all, these are all run, run of the mill medications. Zetia has actually been um, disproven to have benefit for almost all patients with high cholesterol. Uh, and that's, um, that's this prescriber's top uh, medication in terms of prescription. Whereas for other prescribers in their specialty, it's rank 70. Um, so it's way down the list. Uh, and, and I could go on. Uh, another good example is Synthroid. Uh, that's been generic for decades. Um, wouldn't readily be clear why, why that would be prescribed as the brand name. Um, but, and you can see it's uh, number four for this provider and ranked 30th for other people in their specialty. And then there are other things that are way down the list, right? I don't, honestly, I don't even know what Effiant is. Um, so, but it's uh, number seven for this prescriber and 348. So what are potential issues that you might wonder about as explanations? OK, are they getting money from the drug companies? So that's a good question. And I'll try to re I'll repeat the questions um, so they get recorded. Any other thoughts? So that's often the, um, the chief uh, you know, suspect. So, you can see, um, uh, this isn't the, the focus of my talk, but um, this is a companion um, database that ProPublica also maintains, which is called Dollars for Docs. Uh, and you can see all the money that's been paid. Uh, this, has been, this was an early database that ProPublica got out there um, before the Physician Payment Sunshine Act uh, data became available. And, uh, and the organization that I work with, National Physicians Alliance, pushed hard for that to make it into the Affordable Care Act um, so that it, it's, a, it's a permanent fixture. Um, you can see that he, he earned uh, $260,000 in a year um, from 60 different companies. And they give you this handy little chart that shows you um, all the yellow boxes or all the... Um, all the days of the year that they would get um, would have gotten payments uh, if you average them out. So it's almost the whole calendar. <laughs> um, and he ranks number two in the in the state in his specialty for for payments. Um, the other thing which is interesting, which um, this is this has long been publicly available data, and people debate the value of um, getting board certification. And there's been a big fuss about maintenance of certification, whether it's too onerous among doctors, which is a lot really inside baseball kind of stuff. Um, but you can look up your doctor or any doctor that you might think of seeing and see whether they're board certified in their specialty. And um, this doctor is not. Um, so it's something else is like a cross check. Okay. So I'm going to pause there just for a sec and, and drink some water. The, um, <laughs> oh, there we go. In the next section, we're going to talk about Medicare service data. So now this is instead, we were talking about Medicare Part D, the prescriptions in the last part. Now we're talking about Medicare Part B, which is outpatient care. Um, so this, they really track all the services that um, providers um, claim that they build for, and then they track all the payments that go out to providers for those services. 
Um, and again, CMS reporting on this publicly only started in 2014. So this is a relatively new initiative, and that was for 2012 data. Now that's 2015, the 2013 data has come out recently. Um, there are about 950,000 providers in the database. Uh, there are probably somewhere around 880,000 doctors in the country. So it's a mix of mostly doctors, but a lot of other providers as well. Um, and uh, with a total, um, total amount of uh, money passing through of about 90 billion. So it, the database includes different data points. So it's per provider, it tells you the total number of patients treated and the total number of dollars paid. And then per provider, per service they delivered, it tells you the number of patients that received that, the number of times. And so they give examples like skin tags. I don't know if anybody's ever had skin tags removed. But somebody can come in and you can snip off 15 skin tags um, and then you know, bill for so many skin tags at a time. Um, so it, you may bill for multiple services in a single occasion. Um, and then it also tells you per provider, per service, the number of unique patient visits that were ascribed to that. And it's an average, so it's not perfect. Um, again, they tried to put in some privacy protections, and this was involved excluding services if there were less than 11 patients um, receiving services from the provider. Um, it does exclude Medicare Advantage, so it's really only looking at the fee-for-service universe, paying the doctor per service delivered instead of uh, Medicare Advantage, which is a capitated system where you pay um, per patient per month a fixed fee, um, sometimes with some bonuses for quality. Uh, and it also excludes what the provider is doing for all their other patients. So most providers care for patients other than patients that have Medicare. Um, so it doesn't necessarily tell you about their behavior with other insurance companies. So in terms of the analysis of Medicare service data, and this is coming from ProPublica again, um, it, as I mentioned, it allows you to compare providers and it compare them across states, but also compare them across specialties to their peers. Um, there's no comparison if there are less than 11 specialists per state because it was felt to be sort of unfair um, or if the specialist uh, has moved states in the last couple of years so that there would be some data instability. Um, and then it doesn't uh, make a comparison if there's no specialty specified, which happens sometimes. Um, it gives you a frequency rank of how often the service was delivered and then it um, tells you a percent of the provider's patients who receive the service. So there are a lot of limits to the data. Um, what's called facility fees are not included, and this is a little bit um, technical, but um, basically it means that you could be a doctor working in a clinic that's within a hospital, and you get some additional facility fees, and then what you bill to Medicare just for the service you delivered looks actually cheaper because it's not including those facility fees that go to the hospital. Um, whereas when, the, um, when a patient sees a doctor like out in a in an office out in the community, it's just that one fee that they get as a lump sum, so it seems bigger right off the bat, even though that may not be true. Um, it doesn't account for the health status of the patient panel, right? So where I've worked uh, for nine years on, on near Fordham Road, the patient population tends to be sicker um, than uh, one of the other sites where we send our Einstein students to uh, you know, in, on the Upper East Side. And so it doesn't, it doesn't adjust for that at all and say, oh, well, your patients are sicker, so it makes sense that you're billing more or they're more complicated, so you're billing more. Um, it also, it also, um, it, it, uh, one of the things that it, it, it glosses over a little bit, but, but to be aware of, is that the provider is given 106% of the average sales price um, for drugs that they may administer in the office. So they um, take a hit up front for stocking those medications, and then they assume that they're going to administer them to patients or before they expire, and then they get a little bit of a premium on top of the average cost as a sort of administrative fee. Um, and then the counts differ by billing code. So I mentioned kind of skin tag removal as an example. Um, the counts may be different for visits or procedures or how many units of a drug that are given. They're not necessarily equivalent. So the last, the last tool from ProPublica was called Prescriber Checkup. This one's called Treatment Tracker. Um, and just to unpack it a little bit, there's a pretty, there's a pretty straightforward uh, search box for provider, city, or zip code, although I have to be honest, it doesn't work as well as I would like it to. It gives some idiosyncratic um, search results sometimes, and you're stuck searching through 400 results. 
Um, but, uh, but that being said, um, you can look for a particular provider that you've seen. Um, and, and I, um, and I did, I did uh, look up a provider when we had a family member who was sick in Texas to see if they were somebody who um, liked to do extra things to bill for them. Um, and it turned out he didn't. Um, so that was reassuring. But I, I'm, I doubt that many people actually do that. Um, so forgive me. The, um, then you can look at specialties ranked by intensity of office visits. So it'll tell you um, which specialties tend to bill higher for a particular visit. And there's, there's what's assumed to be a level of complexity that you deliver each time a patient comes in. So somebody comes in with a sore throat, uh, you diagnose them with strep throat, uh, you send them out the door with antibiotics, it's a pretty straightforward visit. You don't bill at as high a level and you don't get reimbursed as much. Um, somebody comes in with diabetes, high blood pressure, um, depression, uh, you know, heart failure, uh, they have three different specialists they see, they have a case manager, they have a social worker, all these different things that play into it. Um, and you spend an hour with them uh, for what was scheduled to be a 15 minute visit and you, um, and you bill at a higher level and you get reimbursed higher. Um, so it kind of gives you an idea of whether people are billing in the, in the, in, in the parlance of, of billing, they call it upcoding. So there's always a concern that you're actually billing for more stuff than you're delivering. Oh, I asked about their cholesterol medication, so I added that in as a diagnosis, and now I'm billing for more services that I delivered. Um, so I didn't, I didn't mean to pick on this particular um, family, but uh, from, what I, from what I could gather from my research on the internet, I believe that this is the nephew of the, um, of the doctor that I mentioned previously. Um, so, but, I, but I won't mention their names for the sake of the recording. Um, so uh, this person is listed as one of the top family medicine providers in New York, and that's not like best quality provider, best loved by their patients. Um, he provided 38,000 services over a year. That's a lot. I mean, I don't even, I can't even imagine what that would look like. Um, even working, you know, five days a week seeing patients. So he ranks number one out of 3,000 providers in the database. Um, and that's, that's only for 281 patients. Um, and payments for Medicare also came out on top, 1.26 million. Uh, an average payment per patient was uh, $4,500. So that's a lot of care, right? It must be, must be amazing care. Um, so, because uh, lots of care is good care, right? Um, the average services per patient, 100 and, oh, so, and the average for his peers was $259 paid per patient. Um, and the average services per patient was 136 services per patient per year, which again is, Remarkable. The average is six services per patient per year. Um, so let's talk a little bit about this. Um, this doctor is board certified, but um, ProPublica, not necessarily their fault, probably CMS actually, uh, has them misidentified as a family doctor when they're actually an internist. Not necessarily a big deal, but if you're comparing them to your, their peers, you're not actually comparing them to the right peers. Um, so something to be aware of. So again, good to cross check the data. Um, before you pillory somebody publicly. Um, so uh, let's look at, at their provider. And this is, what the, um, this is what the breakdown looks like if you look at it on the ProPublica website. Um, again, it gives you how they rank in the number of patients they take care of, how they rank in the services performed, um, the average services per patient, and then it gives you the percentile. So he's in the top 10%, which is not surprising. Um, the total paid compared to their specialty, and then the average paid per patient, and again, the top 10 percentile. And then they give a little bit of a note at the bottom. Oh, by the way, 64% of this provider's Medicare payments were for drugs administered in his office. So a lot of drug administration in the office, which is usually, you might see that with an oncologist, you know, who's administering chemotherapy or something like that, um, but for a general practitioner out in the field. And I tried to do as much research as I could to see whether this was somebody who had subspecialty training, and I didn't find anything suggesting that that was the case. Um, but that's a caveat, because of course I might not have completely researched it. 
Um, you can see, interestingly, you can bill basically from a one through five for the complexity of the case, with which five being the most complex case that gets reimbursed the most. Um, and this provider says, eh, I don't really have any you know, level five patients. So all of that extra income is not coming from you know, billing for very high complexity. Um, but as was mentioned in the previous slide, it's more for all the other extra bells and whistles that the patients are getting when they come in the office. Um, and then you can look at the services they deliver, which is, which is kind of amazing. So um, Privigen. I had never heard of this medication before looking up this doctor. Uh, it is an immune globulin, um, which there are many immune globulin treatments for a variety of different things. Um, you know, there are some recent ones for uh, things like Crohn's disease, inflammatory bowel disease, which are very effective. There's um, that you, you can get immune globulin treatment for, for rabies. I mean, there's like a lot of, it's, you know, it's a great treatment that's very effective for particular diagnoses. Um, this one, I, so as I mentioned, I had to look it up. Uh, it's for idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura. So like when you have low platelets and you don't really know why, um, which could mean that you have problems uh, forming blood clots if you get a cut or something like that. Uh, and it has maybe one or two other official indications. So again, not clear um, why one out of every 10 patients that he sees gets this. Um, and five or fewer providers in the specialty in New York perform this service. Again, with a grain of salt because they, they um, misattributed his specialty. Um, so, and then a second immune globulin, Gamunex. I didn't even look that one up, so I don't know what it does. Um, but it's kind of the same story. Um, and those brought in $664,000 billed to Medicare and $382,000 billed to Medicare. Uh, and Medicare paid most of it. What is that? That's like three quarters. So, and then he does um, a lot of uh, ultrasounds of people's hearts, uh, including color. Um, so 44% of his patients, so almost half of his patients um, got an echo of their heart, which, you know, I, I, is, uh, it's very unlikely that half of his patients need, need one of those. Um, it's really, uh, really for diagnosing congestive heart failure or problems like that. Um, but, uh, and most doctors don't do them in their office necessarily. We have a cardiologist that works in the community health center where I've worked for the last nine years, um, and he's, he, he doesn't do echoes himself. Um, and his numbers look very different from this. Um, and then he, he does diagnostic exams looking at people's voice boxes and their nasal passages looking at an endoscope. So if I look with a, with a flashlight, you know, a, an otoscope or an ophthalmoscope, what we have as standard equipment in our clinics, uh, you don't really bill anything for that. It's just considered physical exam. But if you look with the endoscope, that's an extra $21,000 a year, which Medicare said, oh, wait a sec, we're only going to give you $6,000. And then another $40,000 a year for the nasal passages. And they say, well, we'll give you half of that. Um, so still a lot of money. And um, he's ranking very high um, in terms of performing these. All right, so getting back uh, to what we were looking at before, he's actually not really prescribing that expensively. So, you know, people have different habits and one doesn't necessarily predict the other. That shouldn't be a surprise to people, but just as a reminder of what we were talking about a few minutes ago. Um, but then interestingly, if you look at the specific things he's prescribing, uh, a lot of uh, oxycodone, uh, uh, otherwise known as Percocet, um, and then a lot of alprazolam, which is, uh, which is used for anxiety, but it's short-acting, so it's actually usually like the, the last thing that you prescribe um, after other things haven't worked. Uh, and you can see he, it's the third most common thing he prescribes, and for other prescribers in his specialty, it's rank 31. Um, and he gives a lot of um, azithromycin antibiotics, um, and it's 55th uh, among his peers. Uh, so, but he's mostly prescribing generics. Um, and he doesn't get a lot of money from industry. I mean, he did get paid by 18 different companies and it was about $4,000, but peanuts compared to the other doctor we talked about before. So then I, um, I, then I looked at his LinkedIn page to see a little bit, because I was trying to figure out, does he have other, you know, specialty training and things like that? And it's not, I, I didn't see it anywhere on his LinkedIn page. Um, but 
uh, he does, if you zoom out, and so you can't read this, but um, you can see the little yellow highlights. He mentions revenue seven times on his page. Um, so just as like another cross check. Um, so not to be funny, but the, uh, well, maybe to be funny. So th there, there are some issues um, possibly with his uh, patterns of delivering services. And we wouldn't know about them without the database. So let's talk about some interventions, and then maybe we can have some Q&A and talk about this a little bit. So obviously, there are professionalism um, ways of addressing some of these issues. Uh, at the National Physicians Alliance, we were founded, again, uh, around avoiding conflicts of interest with taking money from pharmaceutical and device companies, which is our unbranded doctor campaign. We had a campaign more recently around good stewardship, which was about not doing stuff that is harmful or has no benefit, um, but doctors still do for some reason, sometimes for reimbursement, but sometimes just out of habit. Um, and that, that actually grew into a Choosing Wisely campaign, which has been this huge campaign across specialties from the uh, American Board of Internal Medicine Foundation and a partnership with Consumer Reports. Um, so you can go that route, uh, but to be honest, it's been challenging because there were times when um, the American Medical Association, for example, was, um, was warning doctors about um, these sort of conflicts of interest and it didn't really go anywhere. Um, so um, then, there are, uh, then there's the route of consumer engagement, right? So as part of this Choosing Wisely campaign, Consumer Reports and ABIM Foundation have tried to promulgate these five questions you should ask your doctor, um, which I think is great. And um, I've been trying to work this into educating students and residents um, and figuring out how to um, um, activate patients before they go into their doctor's visits to be able to um, be comfortable talking about these things. Um, you know, so do I really need this test <laughs> or, this, or this service you're going to deliver to me? Um, what are the downsides? And is there something that's less complicated and safer? Uh, and what happens if I don't do anything? Oh, well, you could come back and see me in two weeks, and most likely this will be gone. And, um, and how much does it cost? Uh, you know, and are there any other equivalent alternatives where I could expect just as much um, of a benefit without uh, emptying my wallet? Um, we actually, uh, we were working and we have a beta version now, um, what's uh, an app called Tandem Health uh, that we're working on with Consumer Reports and it has a provider side and a patient side to facilitate these conversations uh, on different health issues. So then there's media attention. I talked ad nauseum about ProPublica. I don't take any money from them. It's just a, a great public database to be able to sift through. Um, I feel like maybe I'm stepping on the audio cable. Uh, and, and there have been a lot of reports on this in the New York Times, NPR, other media outlets. Um, and then there's government intervention, which is slow to come and, and happens sort of like once a generation often. Um, but instead, in terms of legislation, regulation can happen and does um, from administration to administration. And then CMS can change their insurance policies um, sometimes without, you know, they already have regulatory authority, they just change their policies. Um, so let's talk about some of these questions and then I'll open it up to anybody's questions at all. Um, you know, in terms of the magnitude of, of the dollars spent, uh, I sent around a couple of articles which you might have, might have looked at beforehand, um, and they, they, they kind of grapple with how much of a problem this is, but they, for me at least, it wasn't that convincing a picture that like this is where all the money is going. Um, you know, when you look at outliers like this, there's definitely something up and, and probably needs to be looked into, um, but I'm not sure that when we have runaway healthcare costs, this is all of, the, all of the picture or even the majority of the picture. So just to think about like where we should invest our energy. Um, and then are all public payments to doctors fair game for disclosure? Um, you know, it's a public agency, so, you know, and it, uh, so they got the information from a FOIA request, but before that, it was never thought that it would be appropriate to disclose that information, so we could talk about that a little bit, and I'm sure you guys are much more well-versed um, in that discussion. Uh, and then is patient privacy truly protected? The answer, again, is probably not, but I, I, you probably have a better, a more informed answer than I have. Um, and who has adequate capacity to really analyze and report the data properly? And then what's what's actually the best use of the data? Um, because what is, what's going to drive change um, that we're delivering safer care to patients that um, isn't wasting money? Uh, so I think I'll stop there and just open the floor for questions. 
Thank you. So I'm curious, you know, as these things are made more public, I can't help but wonder how they feed back into the system, um, which is to say, does it prompt, prompt doctors to change their practices, both good and bad, in order to position themselves appropriately in some of these highly visible um, data sets? Are you seeing any indicators where they're like, oh, I don't want to give medication or I don't want to give procedures, even when that might actually be best practice because they're concerned about how they'll end up ranking? I th my, my impression is that the data hasn't been out there long enough to see that kind of effect, and so it may still be coming down the pike. Uh, as I mentioned, I looked up a specific doctor for a family member, but I, I think it's probably very unlikely that the average patient is going to this website you know, before or after seeing their doctor and saying, oh, are they doing what they're supposed to be doing, and then, he, and then really able to make heads or tails of it. Um, there is good data that you know, there's all this talk about pay for performance, like we're gonna pay for quality, we're gonna give the doctor an extra $5 every time they give a, a pneumonia vaccine and stuff like that. That actually has lousy evidence supporting it. Um, but, but it's like a management, oh, uh, like if you look at studies in the UK, uh, there's very little, there's like um, no change in, in blood pressure uh, outcomes or management from, from giving those kinds of incentives to doctors. So it has a very checkered um, uh, history in terms of evidence, but is kind of like um, management or business school orthodoxy. Uh, whereas um, in the quality improvement world, giving doctors reports of how they're doing compared to their peers, like, oh, did you know that um, that you're like at the bottom in terms of uh, being able to control your patient's diabetes compared to all the other doctors in the clinic or compared to all the other doctors in your specialty. Doctors are often, you know, competitive and, 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 and don't feel good about seeing that kind of information and that does drive behavior change. So there is some hope that this would be effective, but the question is how do you actually get the information in front of an individual doctor? So they're not looking at it either? Probably most doctors are not yet. The uh, selection of particular doctors uh, by their placement as outliers relative to their peers uh, is an obvious method that you use to select some of these so you could demonstrate how the database works. But it also seems to allow for easy selection of doctors who are already routinely coming under scrutiny. For instance, those who um, more or less are assisting terminally ill patients commit suicide through um, overprescription of morphine and other drugs um, when they're in hospice care. And then other uh, doctors who treat patients with chronic Lyme disease, for instance. Um, my daughter's pediatrician was, uh, uh, was at risk for her uh, medical license being revoked because she treated children for Lyme disease using um, unaccepted practices. For instance, so the prescription of certain medications could flag a doctor who um, is already uh, 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 delivering services uh, services that are already scrutinized. I, that's that's a great question, and I would I would propose two different you know responses to that. One is is the example that I gave of the, of the doctor that's mostly caring for poor patients who have HIV. I mean. They're, they're an outlier if you just look at the database really quickly, but what they're doing is most likely, you know, very high quality care. So, um, and I doubt there's anybody looking at, at, at uh, you know, taking action against that provider in terms of the care that they're delivering. Um, so, so there's always the danger of, I mean, you know, you, you're, you're judged by what's common practice in the area around you. Um, which is often very problematic because if, uh, if doctors around you are all doing echocardiograms on, their, on half of their patients, then you say, well, everybody else is doing it. I should do it too, even though it's not good care. And then the flip side is if you do something which has some research behind it but isn't standard of care, then you're potentially putting yourself out on a limb. Um, so I think it's always a challenge for how... Um, how healthcare is regulated in terms of its delivery by individual practitioners. Um, I, think, I think the other piece of it uh, is I would uh, reach out to the, to the recent, um, the recent, I mean, I hope this isn't 
um, too far afield. But I think about um, the recent incident with a um, tennis player that was, uh, you know, arrested in near Times Square, and um, and that that police officer had a long history of of civilian complaints, but really no action had been taken on it, um, and and the data wasn't really. Uh, you know, easily publicly available f so that people didn't know that the official institution wasn't taking any action. So I would think about, you know, there are, there are, there, there are the cases like you mentioned where people are, are probably doing the right thing and then maybe they're being persecuted and they need support. Um, but then there's also the flip side of where people are doing the wrong thing and, and maybe even the um, regulatory bodies know about it, but they're very slow to act for one reason or another. So I mean, it's it's definitely a balance. Um, about the consumers, um, the the answers, the questions that you advise the consumers to ask to the doctors. Do you have any return, any feedback on what the doctors answer? For instance, if I ask my doctor, "Oh, you prescribing this drug? Is it is it really good?" I'm assuming that he won't answer, oh, no, you're right. Uh, you should take this one instead. So do you have any? Yeah, I mean, you'd be surprised. When you look at the literature in terms of what drives doctor behavior, they often, um, and this is, this is a failure um, potent, uh, probably of their communication skills, they often have preconceptions of what the patient wants. Oh, this patient is coming in because they're expecting to leave with antibiotics, so I'm just going to give it to them. Uh, and a lot of that unfortunately, come, probably comes from expediency, right? You know, it's like, oh my God, I have 12 more patients to see in the next two hours and I'm way behind and I, you know, I'm trying to figure out the quickest way to solve this problem, um, which is not necessarily the best way. Uh, so I think doctors often don't take the time or they don't really have the time to explore why the patient's coming in for a particular thing and then they assume that they want something and give it to them rather than having a conversation. I think some people do argue that if there was more time to talk with patients about uh, what was motivating them to come in with a particular problem, that the outcome would be different in terms of what was prescribed. And so you had a feedback on the answers that doctors were providing, or? Um, we don't yet, and it's, it is variable. Different doctors are more open to it than others. You know, like everybody else, there's a spectrum of doctors being more open to dialogue and or more paternalistic and authoritarian. Um, so I we're, we try to we try to you know move them in one direction during medical school and residency, but it doesn't you know it, there's still a lot of variation. Thank you. And, uh, I'm curious if there's any trends similar to this across whole hospitals or healthcare systems where there's a kind of a tendency to overprescribe or a tendency to overuse insurance. So it might not just be one doctor in the whole hospital that's acting this way. It's just an overall trend. Definitely. And as doctors shift increasingly from being independent practitioners to being salaried, that's where the money is going. So, you know, some of this is like, is yesterday's news, although it still is a big part of the healthcare spending um, pool. But, uh, but definitely, you know, I focused only on Medicare Part B today, but in terms of Medicare Part A, there are definitely hospitals that are outliers. And people like, um, you know, up at Dartmouth uh, with the Dartmouth outlet, uh, Atlas, excuse me, have really looked at, um, you know, very shocking variations in the kind of care that's delivered from one institution to another um, that doesn't have any correlation with patient outcomes. So just following up on patient outcomes, um, so I'm trying to reconcile your what you've presented today with um, findings from economists who look at um, health inequality, um, Yaris Muni and David Calder, um, and their findings on um, chronic illnesses where there's the greatest amount of technological change, including in terms of advances in pharmaceuticals. Um, and their developments in pharmaceuticals, which you talked briefly at the beginning of your talk. Um, what they see is that the health wealth gradient is even steeper for, for, for those areas, chronic illnesses with the greatest amount of technological change. And I'm trying to take that. Um, the, what they pin it on is adherence, right, for patients, um, the behaviors that patients take in their healthcare maintenance and in these new technologies and pharmaceuticals. Um, and I'm trying to sort of like press that against what you're saying. And, and I'm wondering if you could think about 
um, if there could be any explanation that would involve the, you know, the, the um, doctors? Or is that too complicated a question? <laughs> uh, no, it's not too complicated of a question, but I don't, I, don't, I don't think I necessarily have the answer or maybe that we have the answer collectively. I, th I think the... Um, It's, it's challenging because I don't know how they're defining technology and where the data is coming from. It's, it's a, and you're right that that's a data problem. It's very broad. They're including medical devices. They're including pharmaceuticals. So that's, and, that's and an issue with it, yeah. And a lot of this ends up being observational data, right? So they look at, oh, this group compared to that group has these outcomes, and it ends up being a correlation, but nobody's right. ever done a prospective study to right. look at it. It's not like when they looked at the lottery for an enrolling in Medicaid in, in Oregon and they actually knew you know, moving forward what, um, what happened. Um, so I think a lot of those things end up being surrogate endpoints that haven't really been teased out and are markers for something else that's going on. And, and there's an in industry desire to paint the picture in that direction. Yeah. Um, I think, but I think the flip side of that is there have been great studies looking at um, implicit bias among physicians and that, um, the same, um, the exact same presentation of an illness uh, is less likely to be treated correctly um, for a woman or for a minority patient. Um, they looked specifically at um, like a presentation of a heart attack. Um, and so there are, there are issues in terms of um, sort of the individual interaction and delivery of care and that people aren't being treated the same. Um, but but there's, I mean, there's, you know, there's like a hundred different things that go into it. Yeah, thank you. Sure. So one of the questions I also have is, in other fields that we're playing with, uh, criminal justice and education around data and society, what we keep finding is, is that um, attempts to increase accountability uh, and challenge you know, discretionary uh, decision making often have all of these crazy unintended consequences often for the most marginalized people who um, have to face uh, you know, whoever that professional is, whether we're talking about an educator, whether we're talking about a law enforcement officer. And I'm curious what you see as some of the unintended consequences that are coming out in the world of uh, medicine as there's more scrutiny through a variety of different mechanisms on doctors. Uh, and are there places where you're worried or concerned that, that there will be an unintended consequence of increased pressures towards accountability? Um, the part where I see it in regular practice that is really uh, frightening to me is, is um, these uh, quality metrics that have a lot of money tied to them. And especially as you get part of a larger institution, there's an expectation that they're going to go after every quality indicator and every dollar that's attached to them. Uh, and it ends up resulting in a lot of, um, a lot of time uh, interacting with an electronic medical record that's very poorly designed for the user. Uh, and really takes time away from interacting with patients. So I feel like that's a real quality issue, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's potentially sabotaging the, the patient-provider relationship, which probably has the biggest impact on long-term outcomes. Uh, and, and not all of that data is really useful. Uh, I think in terms of doctors feeling like they're under surveillance and doing things and not having a choice. I mean, that's, that's been the standard, you know, line from professional societies for decades. Um, but it's, it's been, it's like a knee jerk reaction to everything. Um, and it, and, and somehow people always figure out how to manage, um, you know, uh, providing care. I mean, I would say I'll take a different tack cause I'm, I think I'm getting negative, but the, um, that some of the ProPublica stuff, I think in one of the articles I sent out, they look particularly at some of these major outliers are providers that are in underserved communities, in private practice, who basically are accountable to no one uh, and are really taking advantage of a population that um, you know, is often uh, low income and may, ha may speak English as a second language, and nobody is looking out for those communities. Um, and so, so I think, you know, the other side of the coin is that there, there are these, they're not a lot of them, but there are a few bad actors that, are, that, are, that really need to be uh, examined because they're exploiting um, people. So, you know, I, I think, 
you know, there are, there are not enough community health centers, but there are a lot of them where people can get low cost care and they, act, they tend to have good quality metrics, you know, or they have a good track record. So you don't necessarily need more outcomes data and you could push people towards care that you know is well built and, and delivers already um, and pull back from doing so much of this like, you know, box checking and, and surveillance, I think. I agree with you to some extent. Um, but, but we don't always have the political will. Um, just being super cynical here, is there a potential then for this data to be used by pharmaceutical companies to then target doctors who are more likely or to, to kind of take these kickbacks or? Oh, they already own the data. Um, they, they buy it from the pharmacies. The, phar the pharmacies uh, sell it to companies that aggregate it, and then, the, um, and then pharma gets it, and then they cross-reference it. They do all the research like I was showing you right now. Like They look on LinkedIn, they see who, and they look on Facebook. If you have a public profile or a slightly public profile, they see who your friends are. They try to get somebody to talk to your friends and your spouse. There's all sorts of stuff. Like Whistleblowers have come out and revealed these tactics from pharmaceutical companies. So they already have all this data. It's, so that's the asymmetry when you say like, oh, doctors, their privacy is being invaded, it's a little bit of a phony argument because it's okay for corporations to hold the data but not for the public to hold the data is, is kind of a strange place to put yourself. And maybe nobody should have the data and I, I could go along with that argument, but since the horse is already out of the barn with private companies um, owning it, I think it doesn't make sense for the public to be uh, fenced off from it. So building off of that, I'm kind of curious now, who might be the uh, interesting stakeholders in this system to try to impact uh, specific doctors or hospitals or pharma companies with regulation or market feedback that comes from this data? That is a good question. I mean, there are, there are a lot of consumer groups that are interested in pushing these issues. And I, you know, I put up consumer reports and they've been one of our partners, but they've really pushed uh, for um, making data about quality and cost publicly available and, um, and it's outside of their firewall so they don't even require you to be a, a subscriber to their regular service um, because they feel like it's a public service. So I, I, think, I think there are stakeholders that are trying to make it available and then there are different organizations like Families USA or other, other organizations that advocate on behalf of patients that are really trying to say, look, okay, we expanded insurance to an extent but medical care is uh, still too expensive you know, how do, we, how do we look at what's going on and propose policy solutions? I think it's challenging because there are so many vested interests. Um, you know, with the Affordable Care Act, the pharmaceutical companies basically got a free ride, honestly, because it was like, you can, only, you can only fell so many giants in one swoop, right? And the main target was the insurance companies, which got a lot of new patients, but then, you know, an exchange had to take a lot more regulation than they had before. Um, Sorry, that was a little bit uh, digressive, digre uh, of a digression. So um, how do you think we could kind of integrate this information into other systems that patients are using to make, doctor, um, to make decisions about um, their choice of doctors? So like Yelp or um, kind of these other review type systems where the people are looking at to understand quality of care. Yeah, that's a good question. I understand Yelp is, has entered this space um, and, and has some consumer partners uh, looking at this in terms of getting information on healthcare providers. I think it's very challenging because there are all these different websites, you know, health grades and vitals and whatever, ZocDoc, and, um, and they, have a, they all have skewed samples and it's, and it's often just like satisfaction, you know, like was the front desk staff nice, which is important, but it doesn't necessarily, you know, tell you much about whether you're going to live six months longer or not. Um, so, but that data is very hard to come by or in some cases non-existent. So, so then you're stuck going back to like, okay, well, what does the doctor do? And is that in line with what we know usually produces better health? Um, because you may not have data on like, you know, their 20 year track record of, of producing better health outcomes. People do include this in the reviews. Like I was looking for dentists recently that would work with the insurance that we have here. And, um, one of the kind of insurance models seemed way too good to be true, so I was looking up all of the different providers that 
take this. And in all of the reviews, they would, like, patients would actually say, like, they were pushing so much stuff on me. Like, I was, felt like they were trying to sell me everything they could. Um, so people are kind of including that and those experiences within these systems. So I think it's definitely beneficial that it's out there. I think it's always a challenge because, like anything else, you can game the system, right? You can pay people to put fake reviews and all that kind of stuff. And but, but I think if we could find a way to do it effectively where we could screen out some of the noise, um, I think it would be useful. But then if I triangulate across those last two questions, one of the challenges that starts to emerge is that you have an assumption that people have choice. And I think that, one, there are people in certain kinds of medicine, um, in certain kinds of states of privilege that have choice about who their doctors are. You show up at the ER, and like you're not going to get a lot of choice, um, you know. And there's a lot of situations in which people do not feel like they have choice, or you know, the circumstances of their lives where like they need to get to a doctor. This is the only doctor that will see them on whatever medical plan they're on at this hour or after work. So one of the things that I often struggle with is if the pivot is off of. Um, consumers being able to be the points of pressure, who gets to put pressure on which kinds of doctor and who doesn't? And that's where I think it's this other question of like, what are the other mechanisms where people could stand up on behalf of, you know, you know patients writ large um, and put pressure when you're dealing, especially in doctor places where it's like, you know, with the ER where you don't really have the kinds of choice that you might be able to think through. Well, I think um, this, this comes to the sort of, and this, is, this will probably be the last question, um, the, but the, um, I think I think it comes to the central question of whether you think of healthcare as a, as a commodity or healthcare delivery as a marketplace or not, right? And uh, we have a, sort of a, a, a national culture of talking about it as a commodity or a marketplace when in most places it's not. Uh, and, and, and in very few ways does it ever function like that. Right, uh, you know, and 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 you could argue that systems like Kaiser are out in the West Coast, and now they're all over the place, uh, actually function better where they don't have duplication of services, but you know that they're held accountable to um, certain quality standards, um, so that you know whoever you go to has met some minimum quality standards, and you're not choosing when you go to the ER whether you're going to a good ER or a bad ER, which doesn't make any sense. And frankly, it's a waste of money. You know, in New York, we have a crazy system where we have multiple hospitals, you know, elbowing each other out of the way in Manhattan to care for the same patients. And then we have hospitals closing out in the outer boroughs because they've been underfunded. And, you know, that there's no reason that you need two hospitals in the same catchment area. I mean, that's, a, that's an idiosyncrasy of the American healthcare system. Um, so, I, you know, I, so I, you know, there's always this, like, uh, philosophical discussion of choice, but it's... it's mostly a false choice. Um, and on that note, let's thank Bill for uh, sharing his knowledge with us. Thank you.